Uh, I went over with a small group in front of me now, but <clears throat> those of you watching on podcast or however it's referred to should know that yesterday I made a couple of mistakes. I was rushing at the end, and I did mention that if you get a hemoarthrosis, about the ratio. So, um, if a normal person's white count is 5,000, and a normal person's, this is serum white count, is 5,000, and a normal person's serum red count is 5 million, that is a difference of 1,000. So, when they give you on a board exam, they'll say that the red blood count, uh, they will never say you have a hemoarthrosis, they will just give you a number, and the number will be whatever it is. So if the number is in the millions, and the white count is in the thousands, you know that it's true blood, which is a traumatic tap, or I'm sorry, or a hemoarthrosis, not a traumatic tap, sorry, which is a hemoarthrosis. If the ratio is off, then that formula goes out the door, because that's not blood that came from a vein into a, a, a joint, okay? So I want you to understand that I said it wrong yesterday. So please go back to yesterday if, if I'm confusing you, and please look at the last couple of things I said when I was rushing, and just know that you have to get that ratio of 1,000 between the white count and the red count, because it will come up. The other thing is that one of the last slides yesterday was a slide that said inflammatory, non-inflammatory, and hemarthrosis. That slide, in fact, um, when I looked at it here, it triggered off in my mind to talk about synovial fluid. And more than 2,000 cell count means inflammatory, and less than 2,000 means non-inflammatory. All I wanted to do, and I know you have this video recorded so you can go back and look, I listed conditions such as sarcoid, hemochromatosis, endocrinopathies of different types, perhaps celiac, biliary cirrhosis, uh, autoimmune hepatitis, I don't know. There was a list of 20 or 30 inflammatory diseases. The only reason that they were on the list was to show you that when you're seeing a patient, whether it's in the hospital or your office or wherever this patient is, you, you must know, or at least think about, those people will get arthritic manifestations of that disease, or more importantly, where I fit in, they come to me first with a swollen joint or collection or constellation of joints or tendons. I have to put that together and make, with good pretest probability, a guess or an assumption as to what category do they fit in, okay? So I threw you off yesterday by talking about the synovial fluid. I have it lined up a little bit better today because today's lecture is the second introduction or rheumatology, Inspira, Health Network, rheumatology, introductory to room number two. And so as long as we're clear, we'll move forward. Okay, so that's what it says. So today we're gonna to talk about data testing because again, there's nobody who's listening to me right now, with the exception of Dr. Gabriel, because he's your greatest asset here at the hospital. He may understand what I'm talking about. Nobody else does, whether they lie to you or tell you they don't. So that's a prop for you, Andre, wherever you are. Okay, acute phase reactants. Why do I order them? When do I order them? What do they mean? Why does anybody order them? So, the acute phase reactants are numerous. There's serum amyloid, there's, there's many, there's hundreds, but the four that are orderable to you on a regular basis and the ones that come up on different cases for different reasons are these. The sedrate, the CRP, the ferritin, and the serum protein electrophoresis. So the ferritin, as one disingenuous doctor will tell you, if it's high up, it has to be adult onset Stills disease. Well, if that person's listening, macrophage activation syndrome is the highest um, ferritin level. Now, it's true that elevated ferritins are seen in adult onset Stills disease, but elevated ferritins are seen in everything where there's inflammation. Don't forget that. And when it's disproportionately elevated to, say, the iron levels, you know it's not related to somebody with hemochromatosis. 
So if you have a ferret in the 5,000, how do you know they don't have hemochromatosis? They may have hemochromatosis. You could check their joints and look for secondary osteoarthritis, which would be uh, wear and tear on the, remember the MCPs? This, this is not a wear and tear joint. So if you get OA here, it's secondary. Or chondrocalcinosis, that is something also seen in hemochromatosis, which we spoke about yesterday. I'm only telling you this back to the ferritin. So if the ferritin's high, something's wrong. If the SED rate's high, something's wrong. If the CRP is high, something's wrong. And if the serum protein electrophoresis comes back with a report that says, consistent with acute inflammatory reaction or chronic inflammatory reaction, please understand that the test None of these tests are perfect, but they imply something is wrong. Not something rheumatologic. Maybe cancer, maybe an infection, maybe something that we haven't thought about, or maybe a rheumatologic condition. So the blood tests are as good as your pretest probability, and you must know that. Uh, for example, there are, are important things. A set rate in somebody under 40 years old should be zero. But as you get older, the set rate rises. There's um, a little adage that we go by. It's, it's again, not a rule, but um, let's see. For females, your age minus 5 divided by 50 is your normal set rate. So an 80-year-old woman should have a set rate between 35 and 45 just because. So when you see that 80, 90, or 100 year old with a set rate of 50, you know what you say? Who ordered that set rate? What were they looking for? Because you expect it to be 50. Don't call room. Say, oh, it's normal for their age. Um, the same thing can be said for ANA. If a 12 year old girl has a positive ANA, that's a serious problem. But if a 90-year-old has a positive ANA, you would see 40, 80, 160 and say, why did we order the ANA? Because these numbers are normal for that age group. Okay, CRP tends to be more specific than SED rate, but there's no scenario that you can't tell me that I haven't seen where I have a very, very sick patient who can have any diagnosis you want RA, lupus, Sjogren's, scleroderma, stills, pick your disease. I've seen them with very high set rates. I've seen them with very high CRPs. I've noticed that if CRPs are disproportionately really high and the set rate is low, this tends to be more specific for infection. Partially anecdotally, but uh, in my own teaching, when I was in your shoes, the adage was, that if you have a lupus patient with a disproportionately elevated CRP to set rate, you should think of an infection in that patient. Is that a rule? Of course it's not a rule. Because the next day you might order the test and they might be reversed. I'm doing an experiment over the last 25 years with one of my sickest lupus patients. He's the only patient that I follow his acute phase reactants. I do not follow acute phase reactants because it's not going to change my treatment. I'll tell you where it would change my treatment in a second. But so this one guy who I have who has very bad lupus with multiple organ involvement, one month his set rate is zero and he's sick. The next month his set rate is 140 and he's fine. And it's become a joke because before he met me, if his set rate was over 90, he was told go to the ER, get admitted. Doc, I don't have any symptoms. Why did you check that test anyway? Well, you didn't feel good. I didn't feel good, but I don't need to go to the hospital. I don't feel like I'm dying. So please use the test with a grain of salt. Here, you want a board question? Board question, 26 year old white female, teaching in the local school, uh, develops arthritis. She goes to the doctor, the doctor orders the blood, and the blood shows her ANA is positive, 1 to 40. Does this patient have lupus, yes or no? Okay, a lot of people are shaking their head no. More testing? Well, the, the first thing is, is if you have arthritis in an ANA that's 1 to 40, 
or even 1 to 1280, do you have a DNA? Do you have anything else to corroborate lupus? Of course not. But what you're supposed to know in this question is this is a board question. You're supposed to know that this 25-year-old teacher is exposed to children who get parvo B19. And when you have parvo B19 arthritis, you need to test for parvo B19. The fact that their ANA is a false positive, it's irrelevant. They throw it out as a red herring. They want you to jump at the ANA. So they'll say, the patient has RA, lupus, or parvo B19. Well, most people get sucked into RA or lupus because they're arguing, gosh, the ANA is low, so it's not lupus, it must be RA. They don't realize that there's something else going on. The history was in the fact that they work with school children or they have 12 grandchildren or something like that. Okay. Um, um, the protein electrophoresis is kind of interesting because while it gives you, like, if, okay, if somebody comes into me and they look sick and all of these are elevated, that's it, done. I know they're inflamed. I don't know if they have cancer yet on the first visit. I don't know if they're infected, but I know they're, I know they're not lying. So these tests are a good barometer to prove a patient's not lying. I told you I would let you know the one scenario that I actually would rely on the test, not with good faith, but I would rely on it. If you have a suspected polymyalgia patient and they had a stroke and they can't answer your questions, if their set rate's 120, I'm more likely to think something active going on. If their set rate is 50 or 60, I say, eh, it's probably normal for their age. So um, since we're talking about PMR, the natural history of the set rate is it starts out at over 100, and it gets treated down to say 20 or 30, and it normalizes at 40 or 50 forever. Um, and then you may check it one day, I don't, but some, some people do, comes out at 100. How are you feeling? I feel fine. How's your vision? Do you have any headaches? Do you have any GCA symptoms? No? Fine. We'll keep an eye on you. So you just say, patient has disp disproportionate set rate elevation. Is there anything wrong with this? No. The tests aren't perfect. We don't treat the test. If you ever treat the test, I will not take responsibility for training you. Because you just don't do that. You treat the person and their story. And then you use the test to try to enhance what you've already learned. You should come up with a conclusion 90% of the time after the history, you should fill it in with the exam, and you should say to yourself, with your pretest probability, I think this patient has somewhere in this category. If the x-ray or blood test corroborates it, great. If it doesn't, that doesn't mean everything, all your hard work is wrong. It just means you can't rely on the test in that scenario. Uh, okay. Oh, um, I told you about that I will use it in an elderly person who may have PMR. There's one other place. Um, oh, the other thing, the protein electrophoresis. One of the things that often comes back in the protein electrophoresis is a monoclonal protein. And um, I'm going to cite from personal uh, true anecdotes that when I see a monoclonal protein, or when you see a monoclonal protein, there should be none. And some, pa some patients will come back with 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes it'll say, please order serum and urine, immunoelectrophoresis, and light chains. This way you'll find out, do they have a lambda monoclonal protein, or do they have lambda light chains, or so on. You, you, you understand, hopefully, what I'm talking about. Those results can be seen in inflammation. However, not until you've excluded a monoclonal immunoglobulin deposition disease. For rheumatology, that's amyloidosis. Why do you want to know about amyloidosis for rheumatology? Shoulder pad sign. Who on earth is weight bearing on their shoulders? Nobody. But amyloid gets arthropathy of the shoulders, so just know that. But the monoclonal immunoglobulin deposition diseases, as they are referred to, would include multiple myeloma, Waldenstrom's, um, and all these other, I think there's an IgA dyscrasia. I, I, again, not my field, so I'll defer to Dr. Minetti, and he is, he's aces. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, so we want to talk about blood tests and what they mean.
you have a patient who comes into the hospital with joint pain and you say, oh, they have joint pain, we're gonna check their testing. So rheumatoid factor and CCP antibodies. CCP is rather new in the last seven to 10 years. Rheumatoid factor's been around forever. Um, if you have a person with a CCP greater than 250 with no other explanation, they have RA. CCP is more specific than rheumatoid factor. Fourth question. CCP is more specific than rheumatoid factor. Rheumatoid factor is uh, positive in 80% of RA patients. Well, what does that really mean? When I was training, it was only positive in 70%. But with better testing and with uh, other diseases that are easily recognizable, the ratios will change. So 50 years or 80 years from now, if you have a negative rheumatoid factor, there'll be a test to find out what do you actually have? We've already excluded crystals because we drained your joints three times and we can't find any crystals, so you don't have crystals. And we've done everything else possible to look for other diseases. So we take these with a grain of salt. Now, I, I can see a patient, I'll give you an example. I saw a consultation many years ago in this hospital system where a rheumatoid factor was ordered inappropriately, but it came out to be um, greater than 500 on back then they called the nephrolymetry, nep nephrolymetry scale and normal was less than 20. So I was immediately consulted for rheumatoid arthritis. So I get to this guy, he has no joint pain whatsoever, absolutely none. So immediately he does not have RA, at least in theory. So you ask yourself, what else causes rheumatoid factor that gives arthritis or at least gives somebody a reason to think somebody should have a rheumatoid factor because they're not feeling well? There's hepatitis C, there's other chronic infections like TB, but hep C is the main one. Um, monoclonal immunoglobulin deposition disease. If you have a positive rheumatoid factor that you can't explain, you need to look for a monoclonal protein. Uh, you need to look for cryoglobulins. All the cryoglobulin is, is a rheumatoid factor that precipitates in the cold. So they're not so far different. That's why you must keep an open mind. Sarcoid patients get positive rheumatoid factors. Lupus patients get positive rheumatoid factors. Sjogren's patients, scleroderma patients, uh, autoimmune liver disease patients, so many patients get positive rheumatoid factors. So if you're seeing a patient for a positive rheumatoid factor, for God's sakes, you should put in the back of your mind, yeah, it may be RA, it's probably RA. Let me exclude the other 50 things. So I tell you this story about this guy who had the very high rheumatoid factor. Well, it turns out that that patient had pleurisy with pleural effusions, interstitial lung disease, and pulmonary nodules. What do those three things have in common? Those are the three most common features of rheumatoid lung disease. So here we had a patient, and it was the only one, it was never described in literature. I, I researched this at the time forever. Excuse me. Um, by the way, I did wear a cool shirt for you guys again, but I promise you. So, you, um, so in that case, I had a guy who you'd refer to as a form first of RA only involving the lung. So that's a patient who had rheumatoid lung disease without arthritis. I want you to understand this concept that these diseases don't read books. They do what they're gonna do, okay? Now, if the same guy had cardiac involvement, no, you don't rush and get him a pacemaker. You rush and get him steroids because he's got rheumatoid heart involvement. But in this case, Yes, you give your steroids for your interstitial lung disease, you give your cell septor tacrolimus for your interstitial lung disease, the pulmonary nodules, you do your scanning to make sure there's no malignancy, and, and so on. Okay. And um, the CCP, if it's 250 or greater, it's RA. And if there's no joint disease, I would say it's RA without joint disease, like rheumatoid nodules or rheumatoid lung or rheumatoid vasculitis. You see, a lot of the, like rheumatoid vasculitis I used to see a lot many years ago. 
with good treatment of RA, TNF inhibitors, we don't see rheumatoid vasculitis. We see it in the non-compliant alcoholics. Just they don't take care of themselves. So they come in with all these sick problems. And by the way, that's an advantage of training at, a, um, at an urban or a um, community hospital because you see the sickest people and you have to take advantage. They are your textbook. Nobody can teach you more than you can learn from the patient as long as you understand what you're looking at. Oh, um, regarding CCP, if you see a CCP that's not 250 or greater, I would say I've seen 180 or greater in my own practice. But if you see a CCP that's elevated, 20, 40, 60, 80, that person has something wrong. Autoimmune, most likely, or chronic infection like Hep C. But you can't ignore it, and it's not RA. Do know that much. Okay, lupus. So, ANA and DNA. ANA is the most sensitive test. DNA is the most specific test. So what does that mean? Specific. DNA is not seen anywhere. I'm sorry, double-stranded DNA. Let's get this straight from the get-go. Single-stranded DNA, you are never to order or don't call me. Double-stranded DNA, don't forget, because if it's positive with an ANA, based on the symptoms, they probably have lupus. So if you hypothetically ran into a patient whose ANA was 2,560 and their DNA was 640, that's a lupus patient because nothing else can do that. However, they don't fulfill the research criteria because they didn't have arthritis, lung disease, kidney disease, etc. Please remember, and I'll say this for every disease, the criteria that are set that you guys are forced to learn are for research protocol and to include a homogeneous group of people. Patients that are in real life could come to my office with pneumonitis, which is one feature, along with ANA and DNA, both off the wall. Well, what do you think they have? They, I just told you that ANA is sensitive, DNA is specific, they have them both, and they have pneumonitis without infection. They have to have lupus, right? I think so. So here's a patient who doesn't fit the criteria, but they have lupus. So the way you'd word that in your chart is, I've diagnosed the patient with lupus based on this. It's a working diagnosis, because maybe something down the road will change, but for now they have to be treated as lupus, and lupus pneumonitis. Or I've seen that scenario with lupus arthritis. I've seen it with lupus myositis. Now, where it gets confusing is if you get an ANA with a rheumatoid factor that are both high, and then you get a DNA that's low, or you get a CCP that's medium. And that's where things get tricky, but I don't want you to worry about that. You need to just know board exam. CCP high, RA. ANA and DNA positive, lupus, done. That's for the boards. Um, the ENA panel, extractable nuclear antigen. The RNP, ribonuclear protein and Smith antibody. Now, let me tell you something about Smith. It's not named after Joe Smith. But Smith is abbreviated S small m. And I tell you this because smooth muscle antibody is abbreviated S big M. Okay, very important. Um, and of course, nobody knows this until you learn it from somebody who knows it. Um, the Smith antibody is as specific as the DNA in lupus. Make no mistake about it. 95% specificity for DNA, I said 99%, but literally 95% specificity for DNA and Smith. But if you're saying to me, wait a minute, I've seen this on the boards, I'm really confused, what do I do? On the boards, you put DNA. But in real life, if there's no DNA and you have a high ANA and a high Smith, you have lupus. Smith tends to occur more frequently in black lupus patients, so be it. I've seen it in white, and I've seen every combination you can think of. But I'm not here to give you the extraneous examples. I'm here to, to make sure that you know what I'm talking about or what you're talking about when you try to call me. And by the way, if your attending doesn't have the time to call me, 
tell them I won't talk to you because if it's that important, they should get on the phone with me. Nothing personal, guys. Mm -hmm. Chain of command. Um, okay, so do we have any questions thus far on this? Oh, I want to add in the single-stranded DNA. I purposely took it out of this slide because I don't want anyone to ever order it, okay? The single-stranded DNA is a very non-specific test. It's a very non-sensitive test. It shows up very frequently, okay? And while we're at it, I'm going to mention something that only shows up with LabCorp and not with Quest. It's the chromatin antibody. The chromatin antibody is not specific for lupus. It is seen with higher frequency in various connective tissue diseases, period. Do not diagnose anyone based on chromatin. And I do not believe in Vector DA, and I do not believe in these other panels because they are not accurate. They basically take a list of all the tests I order, they add some stuff that we don't care about, like serum amyloid protein, and they come up with a formula and they say, yeah, it might be this and it might not be. It's, it's got to be your clinical diagnosis. If you're relying on labs, then you're a bad doctor. It's as simple as that. Nothing personal, because I know you guys do not rely on labs, especially not after hearing me. You do rely, however, on biopsies that are positive. I, I want to emphasize this point to you. A negative test is useless. A positive test is definitive for something. Please always remember that. Okay, where do we, or did we, use single-stranded DNA? We used to use it when we were looking for drug-induced lupus. Now, back in the old days, when you had procainamide or um, all the, the cardiac meds or uh, some of the psych meds, they would give drug-induced lupus. Um, hydralazine, procainamide, I, I don't remember all of them anymore. I don't really see these drugs. But if you thought somebody had drug-induced lupus, you'd get an ANA, DNA, single-stranded DNA. I'm, when I say DNA, I'm always referring to double-stranded. I don't even count single-stranded. But the, the antibody that would be positive would be a histone antibody. So if you have somebody on procainamide who's acting a little peculiar and you stop it and you check their blood and they have a, a, a histone antibody with an ANA, that would be good evidence of drug-induced lupus. So the only treatment is to, if you need low-dose steroids, you use them, and otherwise you just stop, stop the offending agent. Now with biologics, the, the TNF inhibitors, the TNF inhibitors produce antibodies, okay? And uh, so I'll still order the ANA, and I'll still order the histone antibody, but I order the phospholipid antibodies, because phospholipid antibodies are occasionally positive in patients with um, drug-induced, or biologically at least, biologic-induced lupus. So Remicade-induced lupus. So Remicade's a monoclonal antibody. It's revving up the immune system. You're producing more antibodies. Now, if you have a, if you have a um, patient who has no symptoms and you're randomly screening their ANA, you're going to get positive ANAs. Please don't stop the drug. You don't stop the drug because the ANA is, is 500,000. They didn't have any symptoms. They just had a blood test. It's like saying, you know, when I got on the scale this morning, I weighed 628 pounds. I didn't realize it was in kilometers or something, and it was the wrong kilograms. You don't treat the number. You have to treat the situation. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, so since, since we have phospholipid antibodies here on the table, so there's three phospholipid antibodies. The more important is the lupus anticoagulant. And the lupus anticoagulant, you'll see, comes back with like five or six things listed below it. And the lab will also tell you, often tell you, what's positive and what's negative. But the true lupus anticoagulant is derived, derived from what is called the DRVVT, the diffuse Russell Viper venom time. Yes, Russell Viper. So true snake venom. So the Russell Viper venom time, if it's elevated, then it is said you have a lupus anticoagulant. They have to do mixing studies to determine whether or not there's a factor deficiency. And as long as there's no factor deficiency and the patient has lupus anticoagulant, the syndrome of phospholipid antibody syndrome would be a lupus anticoagulant or, as I put up, um, phospholipid antibody, um, uh, beta-2 glycoproteins, and each one has more specificity and importance than the others. The IgG is the most important, and the higher the value, the more it means. So IgG, cardiolipin antibody, 
that along with, with lupus anticoagulants, both have a very high incidence of patients with um, the three main things would be venous thrombosis, um, uh, early trimester abortions, miscarriages. So, like, I believe the new definition is if you have one first trimester miscarriage unexplained with a positive lupus anticoagulant or beta 2 like a protein IgG greater than 100, you fulfill the criteria for phospholipid antibody syndrome. And the other one would be thrombocytopenia. So if you see a patient with thrombocytopenia and you think they have lupus or Sjogren's, well, in lupus, uh, they're going to have antiplatelet antibodies. In Sjogren's, they're going to have hypersplenism. In phospholipid antibody disease, they're not going to have those things. So that's how, you dis that's how you distinguish it, by knowing it, you know? If you understand that there's a mechanism for why each thing happens, all you got to do is sit down, even if you write cheat sheets, and say, okay, I'm dealing with a patient with a platelet count of 64,000, and all their, all their labs are crazy. What's going on here? Okay, check their spleen. It's normal size, it's working fine, so it's probably not from Sjogren's. You find other features of lupus? Okay, did, did you check the platelet antibodies? Well, they're normal. Okay, so how do we know that this patient simply doesn't have phospholipid antibody syndrome? Is they didn't have miscarriages? They didn't have a clot yet? Ah, but they have migraines and they have headaches and they have haunting things or something, some sort of chorea. Um, so there are other features of phospholipid antibody syndrome. I gave you the three main ones. The three that you need to know for the boards. Okay. I apologize for my eyeglass difficulty today. Okay, so what happens if you get that patient who's got a positive ANA that was done for an inappropriate reason? Well, there is a 5 or 10% false positive rate. But is there really? Well, the older they get, the more likely you are to have a positive ANA. And the younger you are, the more important that ANA is going to mean. But if you get somebody who came for a um, general routine visit, and you did their chemistry, CBC, urine, and for some disingenuous reason, you threw in an ANA, and it comes back at 320 or 640, how are you gonna explain that to the patients? Well, the first thing you're gonna do is refer to rheumatology, and rheumatology is gonna say, at least to themselves, why the hell did they order that damn test? It's not part of routine screening. I say this every day, by the way. So, then you have to start thinking outside the box. There's many autoimmune diseases that are not RA, lupus, Sjogren's, scleroderma, and myositis. How about Hashimoto's thyroid disease? That would be the most common. So if I get a positive ANA, and I have no idea where it falls, I get the thyroid antibodies, they're positive. If they don't have thyroid antibodies, I have to start thinking really outside the box. I have to start thinking about acetylcholinesterase antibodies. I have to think about intrinsic factor and parietal cell antibodies for pernicious anemia. People get these things. And if you don't look, you're not going to know. I mean, they may be rare, but let's say 100,000 people in the country have a disease. Okay, well, it's unlikely you're going to see one. But wait, what if one lives in your neighborhood and they come to you? Now, I only have one family in my whole practice with Fabry's disease. It's a very rare disease, but guess what? If I didn't get that kidney biopsy and find Fabry's disease, they wouldn't know why they're dying, and now they're doing okay on Fabrizyme. Even though the uh, hematology group decided to steal the patient from me, which is another story, um, and I recently just found a Gaucher's patient, so I have now one family with Gaucher's disease as well. You don't really need to know about Fabry's and Gaucher's disease, but, well, you may, not in internal medicine you don't need to know. Uh, at a higher level you do. Anyway, I'm just giving you examples that I think are important, take home lessons, because I'm not trying to just force data down your throat. I want you to understand what's going on. So you get the point that if you have a positive ANA, yes, it, it can be a false positive, but to really call it a false positive, you need to go through all the other things that can do it. And one thing not listed on this slide is a very, very big category of immune-mediated polyneuropathy. There's the MAG neuropathy, the GM1, Osceolo neuropathy. Those, those are two. I, I don't have to go through the list, but I want you to understand. Okay, typical Sjogren's patient is not SSA and SSB. 
It's ANA, SSA, SSB, and rheumatoid factor. What's the least important of those tests? The SSB. The SSB has very limited value. The SSA is quite interesting. The SSA alone, patient comes in the office, I have joint pain in the positive SSA. Okay, you have Sjogren's, not so fast. Um, that would be the same as the patient coming in and saying, I have an ANA and dry mouth, I have lupus, not so fast. So you can have primary Sjogren's with dryness, or you can have lupus with sicka. You have to do your homework. So, um, the patient with um, um, SSA positive alone, which comes up, neonatal lupus syndrome, congenital fetal heart block, subacute cutaneous lupus rash, which is not part of having systemic lupus, it's a disease. Um, and then the SSA can be seen in Sjogren's or lupus. So in a lupus patient, you may have ANA, DNA, SSA. Why is the SSA there? Because there's a percentage of people with lupus who get SSA. And then on the flip side, there's Sjogren's. Well, they have ANA, SSA, rheumatoid factor. They don't have SSB. That's okay. There's a percentage of Sjogren's that don't get SSB. Who cares? You have to get the whole picture with the symptoms. You have to put the picture together. And... But you know what? For the boards, SSA, SSB, rheumatoid factor equals Sjogren's. Don't even think about rheumatoid arthritis. It's Sjogren's. Can you have Sjogren's arthritis? Of course you can. Can you have Sjogren's neuropathy? Of course you can. Board question, which of the autoimmune diseases that I keep talking about, RA, lupus, Sjogren's, scleroderma, myositis, which one gives elevated urine pH? Of course you know, it's Sjogren's because they get renal tubular acidosis because the kidney involvement is again very different than it is in lupus. In lupus you get glomerulonephritis. In Sjogren's you get tubular disease, tubular interstitial disease and renal tubular acidosis, okay? So there's a lot more to this stuff. Now, why do I have cryos and SPEP listed here? So when you have a Sjogren's patient who's not doing well, they could have cryoglobulinemia. When you have a Sjogren's patient who's stable, you want to follow their SPEP because if there's a drastic increase in protein, that's a harbinger that they're going to de develop um, lymphoma. Do you know that the incidence of lymphoma in Sjogren's is 44 times the increase of the general population? So please know that Sjogren is a B cell proliferative disease treatable with rituximab, although not FDA approved because it's expensive. Okay, good. These are all board questions. Scleroderma. Um, you know, I have to tell you about a patient I saw this morning. This lady, I personally diagnosed with lupus based on arthritis, ANA, DNA, Smith antibody, and I'll say I think she had rash and I think she had lung disease. Those are being evaluated currently. There was always something that I thought was peculiar about her because she had a hypertensive renal crisis. Her blood pressure was 240 over 140 and her renal function was going downhill. And she was seeing cardiology and renal and she was getting every drug from every class in maximal dose. So I said, you know, something doesn't smell right. I threw the drugs out. I started Captopril 800 milligrams a day and overnight the blood pressure was normal. And by the way, we do use doses between two and 800 milligrams of Captopril. Captopril is the number one because that's where the studies were done. When they don't approve it, you need to use Benzopril, but you need an ACE inhibitor. Without an ACE inhibitor, back in the old days, bilateral nephrectomies. But in the new days, you use as much ACE inhibitor as you need to get the blood pressure down. You just have to make sure they don't have bilateral renal artery stenosis because then you'll have a problem. Um, so the SCL70, the centromere antibodies, those are, those are the more common practical ones that you're gonna see on your exams. You may see the RNA polymerase 3, and I'll mention why. The U3 RNP or fibrillin antibody, I don't think you guys need to worry about. But just know there's four antibodies specific to scleroderma. So the SCL70 antibody, that antibody tends to be seen with interstitial lung disease. The centromere antibody goes with pulmonary artery hypertension. And the RNA polymerase 3 is seen 
in scleroderma hypertensive renal crisis or in malignancy. Those are the things you must know. The rest of this stuff, you'll figure it out if you become me one day, but you must know those things. And the U3 RNP, you should know that it exists and it's not some fake test. I consider chromatin a fake test because it's not specific for anything. In fact, I think what it says, this test is positive, it's consistent with the disease. Okay, like your test is positive for wearing glasses, therefore you're either, you, you like the style or you can't see. Okay, muscles. Uh, not my favorite topic because it's very complicated, I'm not as bright as I look. But there's a patient in 515 over at Mullica Hill that I did a consult on about three days ago. It was my introduction to Mulligan Hill. Nice, clean place. Um, but anyway, so th there's a handful of things. And somebody asked me yesterday, I think maybe, maybe you asked, asked me this yet. I don't know, somebody asked me. Who cares who asked me? It doesn't matter. Um, uh, and any, by the way, anyone who wants to sleep who knows more than me, you're, you're welcome to go home. And that goes for you guys on the TV screen. Because we did have a sleeper yesterday. His head, head was bobbing. I don't like that. Okay. Um, so... When I was a, a child, back in rheumatology, there was polymyositis, there was dermatomyositis, and there was inclusion body myositis, and those were known as inflammatory myopathies, uh, created by a, a, a scholarly group named Bohan and Peters back in 1975. I'm really dating myself. Do I look any more than 40? Come on, let's be serious. Um, so, uh, things have evolved, and now the way myositis is looked at, and this is very important, okay? All these people that come to the ER with a CPK of two, three, four, five, six, seven thousand who are not having an MI, they don't have rhabdo, but every single solitary one is mislabeled as having rhabdo. Does anyone even know what in the hell rhabdo means? Rhabdo is kidney failure from myoglobin clogging tubules, okay? Having a CPK is not rhabdo. Having a CPK means you're having muscle breakdown. So since I mentioned rhabdo, I want to tell you that nobody in this room is ever, or watching me, ever, ever, whoever you are, you don't order aldolase. Why? Because the only condition ever known in history to give higher aldolases than CPK is the eosinophilic myalgia syndrome, which is caused by L-tryptophan for sleep, which we don't use, have, or have access to. So ordering aldolase is proving to your attending that you heard of aldolase, but you and the attending both need to know you don't need it. Now, if you have a 90-year-old lady who's frail, whose normal CPK is 20, they can still have myositis. Well, how are you going to know? Because their CPK can't go up. They have no muscle. That's where you check the urine myoglobin. So if they're spilling tons of myoglobin, whatever they break down is getting peed out. So that person has rhabdo if they go into renal failure. You don't just pee myoglobin and say I have rhabdo. It's a syndrome of renal failure with the, with the myoglobin, okay? So for all of you, and, and don't tell me otherwise, every one of you listening to me now has diagnosed and admitted somebody incorrectly as rhabdo because their CK was high and they didn't have an MI. So nobody has rhabdo. In fact, there's only one case report in the world, there were three, of a person with polymyositis presenting as rhabdo. It's not common. So let's get to the, what does a rheumatologist need to know and do? We treat inflammatory muscle disorders, and if they're not inflammatory, we get them to our neuromuscular physiologist, and they can decide which category they fall in. Glycogen storage diseases, McArdle's disease, um, lipid storage diseases, uh, mitochondrial myopathies, acid maltase disease, Pompe's disease. You don't need to worry about this stuff, but I need to explain the concept. So let's go back. We, we have the person, and I went to this lady in room 515 over at the, the hospital. This is a tragic story with a happy ending. The happy ending is that I saw her in bed. She has very severe uh, proximal thigh and shoulder weakness, defined by, ma'am, can you wash your hair? No. I bet your shoulders feel heavy, right? Yeah. You can't get in and out of the car. Oh, no. 
Your thighs are heavy, right? Yeah. Okay, so she's got proximal weakness. So when you get to that point, how do you have, are you able to eat? Only liquids, I can't swallow the solids because the muscle in the esophagus is no good either now. The next thing would be shortness of breath, diaphragmatic weakness. The next thing would be double vision because of uh, cranial nerve six and whatever muscle is innervated by cranial nerve six, it gets weak and you see double. Um, and I don't mean to be blasé that I don't remember the name of the muscle, but it doesn't matter really. Okay, so CPK you have to order. You need to know if the muscles are inflamed. Myoglobin, I mean, uh, sorry, um, uh, why not aldolase? I just explained to you, because it's only for eosinophilic myalgia syndrome, which hasn't had a case since 1979. This should say urine myoglobin, not one word. Somebody typed it wrong, don't blame me. Now, important categories are immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy and dermatomyositis. The lady up in the hospital in 515, I, I think she has statin-related immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. Now, you can have a lot of people on statins that get aches, pains, whatever, but um, to have true immune-mediated immune necrotizing myopathy, which is a new classification, that person has to have muscle biopsy that shows um, um, uh, no muscle inflammation. Um, so it's immune-mediated immune -mediated dead muscle, but there's no inflammatory. So in poly and dermato, you get degeneration, regeneration. In immune-mediated, you don't see degeneration or regeneration. Okay. The only muscle disease that you can get away with without doing a biopsy is a classic dermatomyositis. Back to the immune-mediated, I want you to know two things. First of all, it does not have to be from statins. It's associated with statins. And if it is associated with statins, the HMG CoA reductase antibody will be positive, highly positive, and treatment will bring that level down. Um, then there's the SRP, signal recognition protein. If this is positive in the feature, in the um, uh, case of immune-mediated myopathy, this is a very bad prognosis. They're gonna get everything plus the kitchen sink and they're not gonna do well. Those people are gonna usually die while the HMG-CoA reductase patients are gonna lead a normal life. Um, dermatomyositis, um, and by the way, so the antibodies that you need to order if you're thinking immune-mediated immune necrotizing myopathy is the SRP and the HMG-CoA reductase antibody. If you didn't order those two tests, sorry pal, you got the question wrong on the test. Now, for dermatomyositis, there's a list of antibodies that are very long. The important ones, the MI2, MI2 happens to be associated with uh, a mild case of dermatomyositis, a case that needs to be treated and they do well. Um, the MDA5 happens to be associated with amyopathic dermatomyositis. Does anyone know what that is? Of course not. So amyopathic means you have all the features of dermatomyositis, the classic rash, maybe even the classic interstitial lung disease, but you don't have muscle weakness. It's associated with cancer. So when you see the MDA5, and, and by the way, MDA5 stands for uh, Mel melanocyte uh, not melatonin it's melanin derived antibody something like that but anyway we know it is MDA5 and it's very important to, you must know about it it's new in the last five years it'll be on some board exam and just know that it's associated with dermatomyositis mostly amyopathic and with malignancy you must know that TIF gamma, TIF gamma is an antibody seen in myopathy that's associated with cancers. Okay, now why is it that dermatomyositis is the one that can avoid a biopsy? It's because the rashes are so classic in the uh, picture of somebody with high muscle enzymes, proximal muscle weakness, insidious onset of disease, you've ruled out malignancy. That's the one thing about dermatomyositis, always rule out malignancy. You don't have to go crazy, but you have to do an age-related malignancy workup. So if they're 50, they need a colonoscopy one way or the other. But if they have myositis, do it right away. And I mentioned, now that we have this new spectrum, and immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy is now an entity, 
it's replaced a lot of what we used to call polymyositis. So polymyositis essentially has now become a diagnosis of exclusion where you get degeneration or regeneration of muscle, where you don't have a dermatomyositis rash, but it can't be immune mediated because the biopsy looks completely different. Um, polymyositis is frequently associated with a more severe course, um, frequent relapses and a very poor outcome. And um, the synthetase antibody, now I, I said that wrong, the synthetases of which JO1 is the one that people have heard about, JO-1, that antibody or, or others that are positive, they are uh, seen commonly in polymyositis and or the associated synthetase syndrome and they are specific for interstitial lung disease and what is called mechanics hands. So I don't have a photograph, I apologize. I can get you one when we do a lecture on that, but please look up mechanics hands just so you get a picture of what it looks like. It kind of looks like somebody who scraped their hand on some concrete or something and they have you know, crusted skin. So mechanics hand interstitial lung disease, muscle weakness, that is synthetase syndrome. Prognosis is not very good. But again, you have a diagnosis. Now, the most rare is inclusion body myositis. What's important about inclusion body myositis? Inclusion body myositis affects old men, old white men, okay? So don't become an old white man. Anyway, <laughs> you can be a curmudgeon or a dutard, but don't be an old white man. Um, so, inclusion body myositis gives distal muscle weakness. Now, can it present like polymyositis or the, the proximal diseases? Yes, it can. But this is the one differentiation. Old white men and distal weakness. In fact, I, I have had one, one patient for sure with uh, inclusion body myositis. They complete atrophy of the forearm down. It's unbelievable. When, and when I do give a myositis lecture somewhere down the road, I will make sure that those slides are included. It's, it's unbelievable. They have literally no muscle from here down. And the, the treatments are just terrible. But there is now an antibody to diagnose, the anti-CN1A. Um, honestly, I've never seen one positive. It's not a common disease. And I've, I've seen one case in my entire life. Um, okay, um, uric acid as it, as it pertains to gout. Is there anyone in the room that's ever diagnosed gout based on uric acid? If you said yes, the answer is you're wrong. Please don't do that. The only way, and I said this yesterday, you diagnose gout by analyzing synovial fluid, and you must look under the polarizing microscope um, or dark field if you are savvy, and you must find the monosodium urate crystals, okay? So, uric acid is your barometer for treatment, okay? The textbook says, and what you need to know for the boards, is the uric acid must be six milligram per DL or less to be effectively treated. Steve Soloway says it should be five or less, and the guidelines indicate, again, guidelines are for dummies, but the guidelines say for tophaceous gout, five or less. Those of us who are purists in rheumatology say all gout is tophaceous gout. It's just a matter of where on the spectrum you are in the evolutionary stage of the disease, like a frozen shoulder. It starts off with rotator cuff tendonitis, that's just the beginning spectrum. Eight months later, they can't move their arm, you inject the rotator cuff and the frozen shoulder disappeared. By the way, room, not orthopedics, frozen shoulder. Don't forget that. I told you yesterday, I'm gonna tell you again. Every time you consult ortho, you're losing your own knowledge base because you didn't consult room. Okay, by the way, the only time to consult ortho in-house is if the patient falls out of bed and breaks their leg or if they're admitted for a joint replacement and they should be on the ortho service anyway. Okay, so the uric acid. Do you need to know it? Sure, you need to know it, but do you use it for anything other than to guide your treatment? No. And if you can get the uric acid down below two, three, four, they can pretty much eat and do whatever they want. And with Cristexa or Piclota case, which is a uricase inhibitor, which is what we use for refractory gout, uric acid must remain zero, otherwise the patient's not tolerant. Remember, guys, we're in the, like yesterday, we're in the two minute, we got to hurry up and get that touchdown, okay? So um, I got to find my best receivers. I need a blocker, and we're going to get through this. Let me just see what's left here, actually. Hey, look at that. It's an art show. All right. So, okay, 
I wanted to talk about, um, well, tomorrow we're going to do imaging, okay? So, I, so synovial fluid. What's synovial fluid? Well, each joint is lined by a lining, and the lining is called the synovium. So synovium makes fluid to lubricate the joint. Now, I told somebody an example this morning as a patient. Um, patient came in with a joint replacement and said, you know, I had a joint replacement three years ago, and the pain never went away. Fine, why would it go away? Do you realize what you just did is you have termites and they took out the rotted wood and they put in a piece of metal, but they never got rid of the termites. You with me? Yeah. You don't take away the disease process. I've written papers on gout and artificial joints. Unless you remove their body, you're not removing their gout or what's causing uric acid. I've written a paper on calcium pyrophosphate in an artificial joint. Why? Because you didn't remove the termites. You with me? So I don't care if it's RA, lupus, whatever. You get joint effusions and arthritis and artificial joints. You just don't rot the bone. You got a piece of metal, which by the way, can become loose, broken, cracked, and you can see methacrylate in the fluid. Okay, so I kind of went through this list, but I told you what you need to know. All right, now, um, I don't like that picture. Okay, this picture I like. So what you need to know for the boards, God forgive me, it's been so long since I've had to think about it in terms like this. A gout crystal is yellow when it is, okay, gout crystals are negatively birefringent with strong refractory power. They are bright, and when they're parallel to the pol polarizer, that's how you know it's a gout crystal. So in this example, this crystal is bright and it's parallel, although I don't have it here. It's called the lambda bar that comes with these polarizing scopes I have at the office. You come to my office someday when you're like totally bored of life, you come. So this is also a gout crystal, but it's blue because when you turn the, the, the refractor, it'll turn blue. Okay. now. This, I don't have time to get into how you differentiate a lipid crystal from a gout crystal, but it's about the angle of where you don't see it. Um, and there's one other thing I want to point out to you in these slides. Um, okay, this happens to be, this is a gout crystal, and this is a calcium pyrophosphate crystal. The reason I show you this slide is because mixed crystals mean something. This does not mean there's a 65-year-old lady with CPPD because she's 65 who happens to get gout. When you see mixed crystal gout and pseudo-gout, you must rule out primary hyperparathyroid. Board question and practical, it happens, okay? Um, this is hydroxyapatite deposition. It's an amorphous collection. This is exactly what it looks like. It just looks like somebody splattered blood or mud. Um, and that's the shoulder deposition. You see it like in dermatomyositis, those soft tissue deposits of calcium, they're hydroxyapatite. Okay, this is alizarin red staining, and everything that's red is the hydroxyapatite. H-A-D-D, hydroxyapatite deposition disease. This is an oxalate crystal, the double pyramid, okay? Can you see double pyramid? If you can't see it, please put your glasses on. Um, so the dark, okay. You're not going to see it. You need to know about it. It occurs in dialysis patients, ascorbic acid deficiency, vitamin C deficiency, things like this. Um, this is a bunch of uh, the bipyramidal. Okay, in imaging we get into tomorrow, and there's a lunatic up front who's yelling at me to stop. So unless there's any questions, I come to a conclusion. And I know you enjoyed today's lecture, so thank you. <laughs>